So we're here with uh, Des Bush yes. today. And uh, to start the interview, as I mentioned before, we're just going to run through some biographical mm -hmm. stuff yep. just to get get everything going. So first, I'm just going to ask you when and where you were born and yes. tell us about where, how it was growing up where you did. Okay, I was born in Mascot in Sydney. Well, I was born in uh, the Women's Hospital, Crown Street Women's Hospital in Sydney. Uh, my parents were living at Mascot at the time. Uh, I'm not sure what Dad, I remember he drove a V-Toy biscuit truck and he worked out at the Ascot Aerodrome for a while and I can remember getting in a big dump truck that he used to drive out to uh, Cronulla Way over the old bridge. Uh, I can't remember the name of the bridge but it'll come to me. Yeah, so we grew up around there. Um, uh, down the road from where we lived there were two vacant blocks and they said, this is where the railway is going to come through. That was in 1947 or 48 or something. And I've recently found out that the railway station never came through there. It's further up the hill, you know, from where the old Chinese market used to be. We used to go to the Chinese market and steal all these vegetables as kids. He actually, he threw the vegetables at us. <laughs> and we used to pick them up and take them around and wander around the street and sell them. It was a great area to live in. The dog biscuit factory was across the road. We used to go over and get big square dog biscuits like that and put jam on them and eat them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was great. And uh, uh, there was a, a, a newspaper place around the corner where they used to print comic books. And we used to get down there and I don't, I don't know whether we were stealing them or not, but they, they were there, so we took them. And a marble factory. Uh, oh, we had a great time as kids, yeah. So, yeah. so you were born there. That's then, where I was born, and then yep. you moved up to Newcastle. Yeah, Dad, Dad became a tally clerk, and the only place he could find work was on the Newcastle wharves. So he, um, he moved up here. Mum stayed in Sydney with us uh, four kids at the time. Uh, yes, Chris had been born, so there was four boys. And um, Dad came up here. Uh, to work and he was boarding up here up the top of town and actually I've still got a box full of all old letters from mum and dad that they wrote to each other about what was going on yeah and mundane things you know about how he'd go down to the wharf and fish and catch a few fish and that would see him through for the week and he'd save a few shillings up and buy a, a roast leg of lamb and he'd cook that up and then he'd be able to make sandwiches for work and all of that and he'd come home at weekends and then eventually uh, mum brought us kids up here on the flyer. I remember the day we came up on the old flyer here, the, going through the tunnels and the, oh, it was exciting. The steam and the, the cinders in your eye and everything, it was, it was great fun. <laughs> yeah, so we moved up here in, um, it was about 1952, roughly. No, no, no. The Queen came here in 54, didn't she? Yeah, so it was 54 when we came up here. Dad worked on the wharves. Mum was a, a housewife, stayed at home, looked after us, four children. And then my uh, younger brother, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, leukaemia uh, when he was about 10, I think, and he passed away. I, mean, I think he was 10 when he passed away. And then um, I remember, <laughs> it's always confounded me this that mum went and saw the priest and, and, and dad saw the priest after this and the priest told them that the best thing for mum to do was have another child she was 42 mm. anyhow they had another child and she finally got her little daughter oh, so okay. now she had the the full set four boys and a little girl <laughs> yeah and um i we, we played around in georgetown we were we we're living there and this is where I first came in contact with the store. The baker used to come around and um, I was able to get a job on the baker's cart. Uh, we got two shillings for the day. Mr. Hines was the baker and he, uh, his horse had come down the street and he'd pick us up at the house and then we'd uh, wander all the way through Georgetown. I only remember doing Georgetown uh, area with the horse and cart and uh, the, uh, the horse just used to sit outside and he'd just wander along the road and we had our big wicker baskets with a cover over the top and we'd just come out to the cart and get the bread out 
uh, go into the house and they'd have tokens, uh, a big one and a little one. One was for a full loaf and one was for half a loaf. So you left whatever they had left out and then wander out and you'd wander down the road and the horse would be down there. And uh, I blame that for my love of fresh bread, <laughs> being on the baker's cart. That and the smell of horse dung, I suppose. <laughs> Every time I smell it, I have bread. <laughs> I would have been job. about 13, 12 oh, or wow. 13. Very yeah. Young. yeah. Well, well, it wasn't a full-time job. It was yeah. only school oh, holidays. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. when they came around. Yeah. Uh, it was probably illegal back then. Uh, I think you had to be 13 years and nine months to work or something or other like that. I yeah, think I was going to ask you before if you could like run through, if you could remember how the route, what you did on the route and like um, yeah. any sort of things that would happen or... Well, it was fairly mundane. Um, uh, Mr. Hines would pick us up in Brett Street and then we'd continue up Brett Street. Uh, we'd get our, ba our basket and he, he, he just said, you know, just come out to the cart. Don't worry about the horse or the cart. It will just wander along and it will stop where it's supposed to stop. And when you come out, the horse will be there waiting with the cart with the bread in it. And he was off doing one side and we do the other side. And you just walked out, you just grabbed your bread, you know, um, a couple of full loaves and a couple of half loaves, because they were broken in half. And uh, you'd take them out and just walk into whoever's house it was, uh, pick up the tokens, leave the bread, and then come back out. And we go down near the park. Uh, I don't know the name of the park, but it's down near Waratah Oval, Georgetown Park. Street there. Yeah, but we used to do all of those streets all the way around, just in that particular area. Um, Moat Street, uh, Asher. Yeah, all, all around that particular area wow. they used to go. Spark Street, Spark Street yes. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, we used to do all of that area there, and then he would drop us off on his way back. Mm. Uh, it would finish early in the afternoon. Yep. I think he picked us up about nine-ish. In the morning? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. So to, to deliver take the all bread. Day. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah, it took, it took most part of the day. But I think we finished about two, mm -hmm. round about that. And, and uh, I don't ever remember him feeding the horse. I don't, I don't remember whether the horse had a bag on it or not. I think it might have mm -hmm. had a bag. Yeah. yeah, and it just munched on that yeah, as it yeah. wandered around. I suppose that's why it was so happy, you know, just to wander around. That's right, yeah, it just went down the road and stopped yeah. and waited for you, you know, and, yeah. and you never gave it any commands or anything. Yeah. And when you got the bread out, you know, you'd, it'd just wander off to the next thing where it knew it had to stop and wait. And yeah, it was quite incredible. I never thought about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. As a kid, you don't think about those things. Yeah, yeah. but... Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, life just went on. I went to Morris Brothers Hamilton. And then uh, from there, that was in fourth class. And then in fifth class, we were sent over to Tyres Hill to St. Pius X. Uh, and that was the first place that St. Pius X was, was over at Tyres Hill. Then went back to Morris Brothers at Hamilton. And um, I just turned 15. I'd finished my intermediate certificate. And uh, I, want, I didn't want to continue my education. You know, I was, wanted to get out and work. And, Mum and Dad said, well, if you get a job, you can, you can leave school. And they never thought I'd get a job, you know, and I traipsed all over the place trying to get a job. I caught a bus over to Mayfield. I walked along all the Rylands and Stuart and Lloyds and everywhere. Anyhow, I finally got a job at the store in the fine china department. Oh and, uh, <laughs> and I was one of the clumsiest kids you'd ever come across. Me, mum was worried about it, you know. She used to say, oh, I talk about a bull in a china shop, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so I started work there, uh, worked in the, the fine china department. We used to sell watches and uh, the fine china department was right at the front door. And then there was the hardware department right behind that. And above us was the, um, uh, Merc Mercery Department, I think they called it. It wasn't the Mercery, but they used to sell all the bolts of cloth and... Um, oh, Manchester? Manchester. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure they called it Manchester back then, but it could have been. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, that was upstairs. And uh, I used to go out to the um, storeroom out the back. Mr. Blair was the storeman out there. And he taught me how to open boxes and I used to go out there and open all the boxes to get all of the fine china out and then cart it back around. 
Um, and from there, I'd have to take it up this set of stairs that went up to the man, we'll call it the Manchester Department, up to the Manchester Department, but halfway was a little doorway and there was a little crawl space in between the two floors. And I used to have to carry all of the uh, fine china, the uh, dinnerware sets and everything in through there. Uh, crouch down and wander You're through. Quite agile, yeah. Uh, I must have been back then. Yeah, <laughs> I remember I dropped one one time as I, I was doing it. Ask you, yeah, if you had any of those sorts of mishaps. Yeah, I dropped one, a whole one, and only broke the cup, the handle off one cup. Okay. Yeah, That's so we exactly. ordered a new cup and yep. had the new set back. So, what do you remember about being hired? Like, do you remember? Yeah. I don't remember. Like? I don't remember the interview. I remember that Mr. Gibson was. Uh, uh, like an assistant manager and a Gibbs? Th Gibbs no, a there was one. Gibbs okay. and Gibson. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Gibbs was the general, the general manager, manager. Yeah. and Mr. Gibbs was a little short bloke. Yeah. And Mr. Gibson was a taller, mm -hmm. uh, very stern but kindly man with a mo. And uh, I think he was the assistant manager. You know, we didn't see much of them, of course. And Mrs. Murdoch was the manager of the fine china department, and she. Uh, she must have taken a liking to me anyhow, you know, I saw some possibility there, this uh, red-headed ginger Megs. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so she hired me. And it wasn't until later that, I, that she moved houses and moved just around the corner from me. By this time, our family had moved to Adamstown. Well, I don't remember much of the interview process, um, but I do remember that they used to teach us how to wrap all of our goods, they take you up upstairs near the main office where people used to go to pay their bill or collect their divvy with their little, they were like a credit card only they were uh, metal, the store tokens. Um, and I can remember you, you put that in the machine and just pulled it down and it went across and it stamped everything on top in um, carbon. And I used to have to do that with everybody who came in and bought anything from the store. Uh, yeah, and uh, then I, being a young boy, I didn't think fine china was really appropriate for me. So uh, yeah, I was, was going to say, were there, were there many men working in the fine china department? There were no men in fine was, china. There was, no there, was, fine china. there was there was Mrs. Murdoch, Wendy. God knows her last name. She was oh, she was old. She must have been seventeen. <laughs> and I think it was Maria, and and um, she was very petite uh, an older woman when I say older she was probably in the mid-twenties yeah uh, dark hair and very very petite uh, and Wendy was a typical Australian girl um, freckles blonde reddish blonde hair you know strapping athletic girl and the other one was you know two completely different and one was quiet and one was a bit louder yeah um, and then I moved into the menswear department and I worked on the handkerchief counter right around the corner from the jewellery counter. I used to sell handkerchiefs and, and uh, socks and things like that. And sometimes I was allowed to sell a shirt, yeah, but I had to, had to learn my trade, you know, and sell hankies first. And, um, and what, was, what was the key to being a good, a successful handkerchief oh, salesman? Just being thing? helpful, being friendly. I, I, so I was a good, good service kind of drilled yeah, into Yeah, I was you. a good salesman. Mm. I can remember one of the senior salesmen coming over and he wanted me to put his sale, my sales in his book because they, they checked your book at the end of the day to see how well you were going, you know. I didn't think that was quite right, so I, no, I told him I wouldn't do that. Yeah, pretty brave, I think, at the time. Mm. But then another story I remember, uh, Mrs Murdoch moved just around the corner from where we were living in uh, Melville Road. We were in Terralba Road, she was in Melville Road, just around the corner. And um, I used to catch the bus of a morning and, and she'd be on the bus also. And of course I'd only just left school, I was still pretending to be a schoolboy and I could pay a penny for the bus fare into the store. And <laughs> I only took thrippence with me. Uh, I think I was earning four pounds a week, which was a pretty good wage back then. I've, I've since learned, you know, that four pounds was pretty good. Um, but I used to get thrippence because mum used to take all the money off me. She'd take the money off me. I'd get two pounds a week. No, 
first job I got a pound a week to live on. <laughs> Wasn't I rich? A pound a week, that was great. And mum kept the rest of it. And she put a pound in the bank for me and the other three pounds or whatever, two pounds left, she used to use that to support the household. Anyhow, I had threepence and uh, I used to take threepence with me. And I got on the bus one morning and Mrs. Murdoch was getting on the bus with me. And I went to pay my fare. And uh, the, the bus conductor said, uh, you can't get on this bus. This isn't a school kids bus because they used to have buses for school kids back then. And Mrs. Murdoch opened her mouth and said, oh, he's not a school kid, he works with me. And I had to pay the threepence fare to go in. I had to she walk home that you. afternoon. She ruined it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and really, other than that, that's, that's the, the extent of my involvement working with the store. After that, uh, my dad found out that there was an apprenticeship available for the railway. And I became, I went in for an interview and I was one of the lucky out of about 600, I think. They picked six of us and I was one, I became an apprentice electrician. Thank but uh, the next time I came back to the store was, uh, I went overseas when I was 21. Yeah, just turned 21. Mm. I came back when I was 32, I think, round about that. I often tell people that when I left and went overseas, I left with a suitcase and a crocodile skin overnight bag, you know, one of those round, quite nice. My brother bought it for my 21st birthday. I came back 10 years later, I had a suitcase, a briefcase and a daughter. <laughs> and that's all I had to show for 11 years overseas, oh, which, was, which was pretty good anyhow. Really I, thought good it, I thought it was pretty good, yeah, yeah. yeah. Grown child, yes. Not, not to be... Yeah, yeah, no, I, my wife and I had split up. Oh, okay. uh, this was in uh, was Vietnam. Yeah, right. Uh, my yeah. daughter and I were refugees from the, the end of the Vietnam War. Oh, okay. uh, I went over there to work with the Americans. Okay. Yeah. But it's interesting, they took, it, was, it seems kind of um, lucky for you in a way that they took a bit of a chance on you, sort of get you, get you started, get yes. you sort oh, of yeah, you yeah. Know, into yeah. that sort of... Well, I was a happy-go-lucky right? kid, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was always laughing and yeah. nothing ever bothered me, I don't think, you know, I was happy. Things, life seemed to be good to me. Yeah. We didn't have much, but yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And um, in the fine china department, we all were also used to do repair watches. Uh, we'd sell watches and had them on um, uh, warranty and any minor little repairs we could do. I used to adjust the, the wristbands. I learned how to do that. And if any, any really technical stuff, I'd get to take the watch down to Mal Wolford's, the jewelers down near the bank corner and give it to him and he'd repair it. And then I'd go back and They'd give me the money, I'd pay for it, and we'd take it and we'd give it back to the, the customer. Um, I delivered a, uh, a tea set or a, a full dinner set one time to Merriweather from the store, and I had to get a bus, and I had to carry this box with me onto the bus. And to get to Merriweather, I had to get a bus from the store back down to Hamilton, and then the bus used to, to Merriweather used to run up uh, Tudor Street, no, Beaumont, Beaumont Street, Beaumont, up Beaumont, Beaumont Street, all the way up yeah. round the junction. Yeah. And I remember this house was near um, Wilton Street. Close. Yeah, and I remember delivering that there and then I had to get the bus back. Uh, and I was shopped around, you know, in the store. I'd work in the fine china department and then go out and help Mr. Blair. And then when I was in the um, menswear department, I was a little bit too senior to go out and help Mr. Blair. You know, I was nearly 16 then. And so all I did was sell stuff in the menswear department. I remember Merv. Merv was the first flo uh, floor walker they had. Uh, Merv. Um, so what was that role? A floor walker. He would walk around the store and that was his job, to walk around the store and be of assistance. More like, we'd call it customer service these days. We used to think he was there to spy on us, to make sure we didn't steal anything. Probably a bit of, a bit but of both. It was a bit, yeah. of, a bit of both. And um, he, he, was, he was gay. Uh, we didn't call them gay back then. We called them really horrible names back then. But uh, he was a lovely man. And I didn't realise, you know, that he was different other than I, I knew he was a little bit effeminate. Well, mm. I didn't even know the word effeminate then, of course, either, you know, but he was a bit girly. Mm. But uh, he worked in the menswear department. I got to know him through that. 
And then when he became the floor walker, he'd walk around and uh, yeah, had a nice relationship with him. And I think it was Mr. Campbell was the- Cole Campbell? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say whether it was Cole, I was thinking about it this mm. morning. And I thought, is it Colin Campbell? He, he was the manager there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well dressed, yeah, a very natty dresser he was with a suit and yeah, I can still remember, he was, well, he seemed tall to be because mm -hmm. I was never tall. Yeah, and then there was an older fellow and I've been trying to remember his name. When I say older fellow, he was well in his 60s, a little wizened up um, fellow, uh, wrinkles in his face and uh, he, he worked in the suit department. Yeah, I never got to. I never got to the suit department. Mm -hmm. I, I was stuck on handkerchiefs while I was there, mm -hmm. hankies and undies. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I mean, a lot of people we've interviewed who worked at the store talked about um, how the store really prided itself on um, quality and service. So, I'm, I'm wondering, was that sort of drummed into you as that an was drummed Those into you? Service. That's this part of the wrapping. Uh, yeah. that we used to do where we used to have uh, training sessions with wrapping and you had to be very sp uh, precise with your folding and everything had to be nice and neat and uh, uh, put the tape on properly yeah yeah and service was a big thing I, th I think that was one of their downfalls that they tried to maintain that service ethos later on when other stores were you know, not providing the service, but they were providing cheaper goods. Interesting, mm. okay. So I, I think that may have had something to do with it. So yeah, they didn't, you know, change with the No, it, it stayed the same. So yeah. you think maybe people weren't as, um, like, weren't looking for that kind of service anymore? It was well, the, the, the service, the, 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 the critical thing with the store was the divity, uh, the divvy. You know, you got your dividend every year and you got your 10% back, you know, and, and then other stores started to provide cheaper goods so your divvy wasn't worth that much to you anymore you know when you could get cheaper goods elsewhere and uh, it slowly went downhill um, yeah. not while I was there no it was still booming I guess going back a little bit more mm -hmm. um, so you say you moved to Georgetown in 1953 54, yeah, 54 yeah, around so mm. um, that was around about the time the Clyde Street branch oh, opened, I think. So I'm wondering right. what your recollections Street. of that time were and your proximity yeah. to that Clyde Street Hamilton North branch. I knew it well. Yep. I knew it well. They caused me to lose my teeth. The Clyde Street store. Uh, the bakery was there and oh, what a wonderful smell. It used to float all over the suburb. It was magnificent. And um, they built the Clyde Street store there and uh, that, that was one of mum's favourite uh, places to send me to buy stuff for her, you know, because it was so close. And she'd give me the token and I'd go down with the money and pay for it. And she sent me there one day and I can't remember whether it was a quarter of a pound of butter or half a pound of butter or something or other like that. Uh, some small item that she needed. So I jumped on my bike with the string bag and I went down to the Clyde Street. It was only around the corner from where I lived, just up Brett Street and uh, down, um, not Boreas Road, Clyde, uh, down Clyde Street, past Henry Lane's and the Lamp Works. And I bought the thing, oh, and as I was driving, well, riding my push bike back home, the string bag, I had it on the handlebar, it went straight in between the front wheel I went straight over and landed flat on my oh, face, face on the oh, road. Yeah, yeah. And bang, right there, they called an ambulance and took me up to the martyr. And they released me, there was nothing wrong. And said, they, I'd better go and see a dentist. Well, I went and saw a dentist. I had a chip out of my tooth. Mm -hmm. I went and saw a dentist about two weeks later and he did an x-ray and my tooth was in my lip. That's why I got that little lump on my lip there. Oh, so he crazy. cut my lip open yeah. and pulled the tooth out. Oh, the only, rough, probably the only person yeah. ever had a tooth removed from their yeah, uh, from their lips. I, I remember the the, uh, the uh, Clyde Street store. It was thin and long. It's still there. It was a battery place for a while, and um, yeah, it's. Uh, so it was your mum's favourite place. The shop, where was that? The store. Yeah, just yeah. generally? So generally yeah. the store. Tell me about mm. your mum, your sort of family connection to the store, your mum as a housewife. Well, mum, mum, mum didn't do much shopping. Um, Dad did the shopping, believe it or not, because mum used to stay at home and look after us kids, and she would write out a list. 
and Dad would jump on his motorbike when he wasn't working because as a tally clerk he was on shift work. And Dad would go into the main store in town and buy everything for Mum and then bring it home and, uh, and then any other stuff that she wanted, she would get us kids to go down to the Clyde Street store and pick it up from there. And we, we used to buy her clothes and everything. Oh, and when we moved to Adamstown, the store had a truck that used to come around and deliver goods, deliver all our groceries. And I think it was a fortnightly thing. And mum used to have the list ready and they'd come around with the truck and deliver what she'd ordered the fortnight before and take the list away and then pay for it. And she had everything delivered then, yeah. So I didn't have to do so much running around. Mm, that's and really it, convenient. Yeah, yeah. Quite ahead of its time in a way. It or, was. I mean, we've mm. sort of come back to that now, haven't we? Yeah, like home delivery. Home delivery. Yeah, and mm, yeah and Woolies is doing all of that now. Yeah, and that was, well, that was part of the service ethos that they had back then. Uh, yeah, of course, the milk was delivered. Uh, the bread was delivered. Yeah, everything was delivery back then. Mm. And they had fresh vegetables on the truck. Yeah, all, everything was delivered to you, whatever you ordered. Mm. Yeah. And really about making like a woman like your mum, who's obviously really busy, had so many kids to look after and wrangle, mm. like that really makes it easier for women at home. Of, of course it did, yes, so yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, you're right, yeah, mum was busy. Yeah. Yeah, with... Uh, with all those boys, we were. So, do you think there was like loyalty to the store? Oh, without or? a doubt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so much loyalty. Yeah, it. Well, it was yours. You owned it. Yeah. You know, you you were a member. That mm -hmm. was in the days when you weren't a member of many things back then. Yeah, you know, like leagues clubs and clubs were very early stages. As a matter of fact, I don't think Wests had been built by the, in the fifties. Yes, uh, yeah, as, yeah, being a member of the store was something to be proud of. Yeah, mm. yeah, and um, we go into the store, go shopping in the store for our clothing when I was a bit younger before I worked there. And mum would be dressed up to the nines and they had, at Christmas time, they had the choir singing the carols down near the lift and the um, stairway in the, um, what would you call it, the grocery department. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah, I remember the Christmas carols every year. Do you remember the display windows at all? Oh, I, yeah. I worked right next to the display window oh, where, the, yep. where the handkerchief counter was. Okay. The main door as you came in, there was the, the window was here. And to get into the display, you had to come behind my counter and open up the door and get in there to do it. So I used to see the, the um, what did they call them, the shop? Dresses? Window dresses. Window dresses? Yeah, yeah. the window yeah. dresses used to come in and I used to get a first hand preview of oh, the really? of yeah. the, the uh, yeah. Christmas thing. So I could only see my window, I wasn't allowed to look at anybody else because they had it all covered. Oh, yeah. That's a secret even to yeah. other store staff. Yeah, well yeah. to other store staff and to the, the, the general public. Yeah, yeah. they had a, the, the curtains across there so nobody could see what was going on. Yeah, oh, I, I, just yeah. Re I just remember when we used to leave the store every evening Mr. Gibson used to stand out near the clock, the uh, clock Bundy, yeah, the Bundy clock, and he would stand there and say good evening to everybody as they left. And every I'm, customer? Ev no, every, oh, every employee. We used yeah. to go out the back and down, out and then come up that side lane, uh, Beresford Lane. I don't think that side street is Beresford Lane. It's but Beresford so Lane ran that way alongside yep, the... Yep. It's Beresford Street, I think, and then there's Beresford, no, Beresford Lane. Lane. Yeah, so we used yep. to wander out that way and across the road to, yep. to the bus stop. Yep. Yeah. And so he'd say... He'd say oh, he, he was there every... I, I, th I thought he might have been there to try and stop people stealing stuff. That might have been part of it, but it was a nice little touch that nice he'd, gesture, he'd say yeah. good evening to everybody as you were going home. Yep. Yeah. So a real sense of community. It, it of was, gesture, yeah. It was a family yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we had a picnic. I just remembered that. We had the store picnic. And we caught a train down to the Central Coast and it was just a train for store employees. Yeah. And um, yeah, we went, uh, I, I'm not sure where it was down the Central Coast. But um, yeah, the whole train full of store people and going down there for a picnic. It was great fun. And they pay for everything? And um, I don't remember that side of it. I, I remember there was, um, they must have they because must have if they, they must yeah, have put stuff out. Employee. Yeah, yeah. Because I was at fifteen, I I think I was more interested in 
seeing how many girls were there than who was paying for what, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yes. Uh, It's it's interesting to me because, so I guess, how many years did you work there in total? I was only there for a year. Yeah, well, there you go. That's all I was there for was a year. What, late 50s to... It would have been 58 to 59. Well, it's, it's interesting that you only worked for that short period of time and yet you have so much connection to the Oh, yeah, I remember. Place, well, it was my first culture. job and, yeah. and, and, you know, because I lived around the corner from the store and I'd worked on the, the baker's, the baker's cart, cart, you know, and yeah. uh, I got into trouble one day on the baker's cart. Um, I was accused of eating the bread. Yeah. Drop. Did you? No. <laughs> mm. So when you came back to Newcastle in the 60s, mm-hmm. were you still a customer of the store? I was maybe? a customer of the store. Yep. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't become a member, um, but I remember taking my daughter in there. Um, yes, I, I was, I was a, um, a shopper at the store. Why I, not a member? I don't know. Mm. I don't know why I didn't join. Mm. Uh, I remember... I joined the medical fund. Um, I'm not sure whether it was was the store medical fund or whether it was NIB. Like that because I do remember going up there and paying my oh, a couple of dollars, I think it was, every now and again. Because you had to go in and pay everything yourself back in those days. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, it was the store medical fund I was a member of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I used to buy the clothes for my daughter and that in there, and yeah, and then it closed. So it was still mm. like a, a big place to shop. It was still a big place know, to shop when I came. I came back in '75. Oh, okay, '75. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure when the store closed. It was '81. '81. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I knew it wasn't open for a long time, or like for very long after I came yeah. back. Um, but while it was open, yeah, we were. Yeah, I used right, to shop there. It was just. Part of the, you know, I never went into DJ. I don't think I ever bought a thing in DJs or mm. Wins. Mm. Never. I, I bought everything at the store. And why was that? Just I, habit, I suppose. Loyalty. Yeah. Or yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, even Marcus Clark's and those places. I don't think. I, I know Mum used to go in there for different things, but yeah, I never did. Mm. And then, yeah. of course, uh, other cheaper places came open, so I went yeah. to them. What's interesting is that, um, you know, so the store closes in the early 80s, but actually um, it seems to me like the downfall, the sort of decline when it happened went really, really quickly mm. because in this mid-70s they still had huge, I think they peaked, their, their highest number of total memberships peaked in the 70s. Right. So mm. it's interesting to me yeah. that it was still, you know, I mean, obviously they were probably behind the scenes. Big shopping centres. Ha- yeah, that's right. Yeah, so. What's that one out at Jesmond? Um, yeah. Stockland and then Stock- Katara that's all, well, It wasn't called Stockland and back then. But right. And I, 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 I believe that that was the beginning of it because it decentralised everything and people could go to these other places and the store was just stuck in town. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so what do you remember about the closure or leading up to the closure? You know... <laughs> I don't remember a great deal about it, you know. Um, it seemed to have bypassed me. You know, I, I remember thinking, oh, I'm, I'm terribly sad that it's closing down. And I was even more sad when I saw they'd pulled it down. Now, I went past and I thought, surely that's heritage. You know, but no, no, it's not. It's just an old yellow building. Uh, my current wife uh, had her reception there for her first wedding, wedding up there in the Allura, yeah. in the Allura room, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of fond memories there like that. And so it wasn't really on your radar anymore, I guess? When no, it no, it's, it, it wasn't a thing to me anymore, you know, like uh, my daughter was growing up and uh, she wanted more fashionable clothes than the store stole, uh, sold. And, uh, and by the time she was 12, she was doing her own shopping anyhow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it just slowly faded out, you know, because you didn't go there shopping anymore. That was that was it. And uh, so it I th- sounds like they're not. It's also the perception is that it's not um, fashionable anymore. You said that your daughter was not, yeah, yes. not keen to shop there. Yeah. I guess yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. She she didn't like the clothes and that, you know. Um, and I think it. 
I'm not too sure whether the um, things were closing down then or not. Uh, I know the grocery department didn't seem to be going so well back then because you in had... In Hunter Street? Yeah, yeah, in Hunter Street, yeah. Uh, I know my dad had stopped shopping there. Mum, mum was now going to other places. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, was that a decline in quality, do you think? Or was no, it a price no. Issue, uh, or? Price. Okay. More price than anything. Mm. Yeah. Uh, distance was never a problem with mum because dad used to do all the shopping anyhow. You know, and she'd only go into town on special occasions to buy clothing. Dad did all of the grocery shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So I guess thinking about, yeah, we're talking about the store's mm. closure, um, I wonder if you could maybe summarise what, or s like say what the store meant to the Newcastle community oh. in a broader sense. Early on the store was the place. Um, everybody knew the store, you know. It's, um, um, I, it was a shopping experience, you know, you went into the store and they had all of the uh, white goods upstairs, the furniture, um, uh, the habit, haberdashery. That yes, was the yes, word yes. I was trying to think yeah. of, haberdashery. Yeah. Even, as I said, the uh, uh, hardware store down the back, you can go and buy nails. And in the shop in front, you could buy your fine china. Like in our department, you'd walk through the fine china department where they had uh, rings and jewelry and costume, no, no not so much costume jewelry. Uh, but watches, and then you'd go down and get your pound of nails or something or other like that. You know, it was it was a real shopping experience at the store back then, and that ten percent divvy, the, the 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 money coming back. I know Mum used to look forward to it at the end. She used to save it up to the end of the year and use it for Christmas presents and and uh, the Christmas dinner and all of that. You know, because we'd uh, we'd only get chicken once a year at Christmas. <laughs> now we have it every night, you know? yeah. Lamb every night back there, or lamb once a week. Sorry, but yeah. Um, and and it was just a general combination of all those things that you know the people really loved the store. Yeah, I don't know how many members they had, but nearly everybody that you knew, you know, was a member of the store. Yeah, I think at its peak, it had. Maybe ninety thousand. Oh, that's incredible! It, like it was a, quite a lot. I yeah. Can't, I can't remember the well, exact Newcastle figure, would have but only, it was really quite a lot. Newcastle would have only been about quarter of a million back mm. then. Maybe, maybe yeah. not even that much. Many. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so that's across all branches too. So yes. you know, mm. it's quite widely spread out. Yeah, it was spread yeah. around a bit. Yeah. 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 I never went to the Charlestown branch because it was too far away back then. It's Clyde Street and the one in and town that was convenient. Yeah. yeah, you could ride your bike into either. To either of them. Yeah. 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 Um, and so do you think there's any kind of legacy that the store has these days or? No, it's just faded into, faded in people's memory. It's only people like myself that remember it, you know, that had actual interaction with it. Uh, but it doesn't mean anything to my daughter. Uh, although she did go shopping right. there. What yeah. she thought about the demolition, if you had yeah. any um, further thoughts about that? I just, well, I, n I know it's progress, you know, and it, it's a shame that they just couldn't do something with the existing facade or something rather and save it and build their apartments or whatever they want to do in there, you know, and, and make it part of the rail system. You know, it's... Um, it's, it's just the way the world's going. I've just come back from Japan and uh, the railways over there, it, they're just one retail outlet with trains in them. Yeah, it's incredible what it is, you know, and that's the way the world's going. Yeah. But it would have been nice if they could have done something with it and kept that, that facade, mm. you know, just painted it up. Yeah. Maybe there was something wrong with it. Rest yeah, of yeah. It. yeah. I mean, what's come out, I think, is like, I don't know if you would have called it like your family working class, but you know, for working class families, it seems mm. that the store was really something quite aspirational a little bit, like oh. to be able to in, be involved in something. It was, it was, it was a place to work. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got a job at the store. Yeah, that's, that, that was really good. Yeah. 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 It was, it was constant work. Uh, you were, you were, well back then everybody, you became a, a, an employee for life basically. The people that I knew there, they'd been there. Merv, the, I mean, I can't remember Merv's last name. I think he'd started there as a young man or a, a, a teenager. 
and he was a man in his oh, probably 40s by then yeah yeah and that's what it was like then you got a job for life 